Hello, and welcome to the Irish Tech News Podcast. I'm your guest host, Ian McRae. I'm a psychologist and author of six work psychology books, including Dark Social, Understanding the Darker Side of Work, Personality, and Social Media. I've put together a five-part mini-series on brains, communication, and digital behavior. I'm going to talk with five really interesting guests about mindset, brain health, psychological education on social media, algorithms and dating apps, and how Web3 and cryptocurrency communities form. My second guest is Dr. Harris Eyre, who has had a range of different roles exploring brain health, including as a physician, scientist, entrepreneur, executive services provider, author, new economic and finance thinker, and neuroscience diplomat. He's a senior fellow for Brain Capital with Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. He's president of Prodeo, a brain health technology executive services group. He co-leads the OECD Prodeo Institute Neuroscience-Inspired Policy Initiative, and I'm going to talk with him about the things everyone should know about keeping our brains healthy. So hi, Harris. Thanks for coming on the Irish Tech News podcast with me today. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about your work with brain health, brain capital, and I know you have a very multidisciplinary, very diverse nature of work. So I think you have a lot of insight um, that a lot of people will be interested in. Um, But first, I really wanted to ask you about what is brain health and specifically instead of mental health or different terms, what's the value of talking about brain health and what does it mean? What should people know about it? Brilliant. Well, thank you, Ian. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you uh, today. Brain health is a fairly new term, which is, is trying to give a more positive and strength-based uh, overview of brain processing and mental processing. Uh, I think we recognize that, that mental health has been a useful term uh, in the past, but you know, mental has some negative connotations and Mental health has traditionally been quite deficit focused. You know, how depressed are you? How anxious are you? Brain with brain health, we're trying to look at well, you know, those deficit issues, but then also strength. You know, how resilient are you? How creative are you, um, etc. And this, I think, gives a bit more of a well-rounded sense of the individual uh, because you can mm-hmm. have you know mental health challenges, but you can also have tremendous strengths. You know, many of the most creative people in history have had bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenia. And so it's, a, it's an attempt to try to give a new uh, label, perhaps, uh, that's less stigmatized, that's less deficit focused, that really tries to celebrate people for, for themselves in their totality. Mm-hmm. And there's a really interesting discussion about how separate or how connected um, the brain and the body are. Or mental health is Um, kind of distinct or connected to physical health, right? Because if you're talking about brain health, stuff like exercise is going to affect and improve your brain health, right? There's all sorts of physical things we can do that affect us, you know, psychologically, mentally. So how important is that connection between the psychological and physical? Yeah, it's critical. Absolutely critical. The the brain and the body are inextricably linked. And um, certainly uh, when you do start to think about brain and body, exercise is critical, nutrition, uh, managing your, your body weight effectively, managing your medical conditions. Uh, we, we know that uh, you know, even your gut microbiome, we understand now, uh, is your gut is connected by a very big nerve that runs up into your brain and there's bi-directional uh, both ways uh, communication between your brain and your gut. So it's uh, really, certainly that's a big part of brain health as well, mind-body connection. Yeah, I've heard a bit about gut health and the emerging research and the connection between the brain and the gut health too. So how much is behind that research? I know it's a relatively new field, but there's some interesting stuff there. So how much is that really connected? What does it affect? Yeah, um, I think that it's a really exciting area of uh, how to improve your brain health. Um, mm. Essentially, we recognize now that uh, the gut is really its own organ system. We didn't used to think that, but the gut actually has trillions of bacteria, uh, good bacteria and bad bacteria that are in a sense in some kind of equilibrium or balance. And um, we recognize that the, the bad bacteria let off some not so good chemicals uh, that enter the bloodstream or go up this nerve into the brain. And that can cause an inflammatory state and affect your mood and give you hmm. some sort of anxiety-like symptoms. But when you have the good bacteria, wow. Uh, they actually release uh, anti-inflammatory or, or good chemicals, and that makes you feel good. And so, um, we, we interestingly, there are some early studies to suggest that a uh, healthy diet, like a, like a Western Mediterranean diet, or particularly the Mediterranean diet, which is full of uh, 
fruits and vegetables and uh, lean meats and olive oils and things like this actually promotes the good bacteria. It helps the good bacteria beat out the bad bacteria in this in this sort of tension that these bacteria have, and and that is probably related to why that Mediterranean diet is, is good for your mood. Um, and so now, uh, you know, there are a few studies actually showing the value of the Mediterranean diet in improving your mm -hmm. mood, potentially replacing antidepressants and anxiety medications in some instances, wow. which is awesome because it has no side effects and it's good for your, your whole body for lots of different reasons, including heart health. Um, and so now uh, the biotech industry and the pharmaceutical industry is trying to really trying to synthesize good bacteria and actually give you uh, microbiotics that you can take that, that basically flood your gut with the good bacteria and really push out the bad bacteria um, so that you're wow. in a better state. So it's a, it's a fascinating area. You can imagine how complex it is, though, from a scientific perspective yeah. because you're you're dealing with trillions of bacteria, and it's uh, so that the but scientists are, are absolutely working really hard on this to, to try to develop better therapeutics. Yeah. That's so interesting and really exciting. I mean, I remember when I was in university in my undergrad too, one of the things that we talked about was psychoneurogenesis. And even 15, 20 years ago, psychologists thought that in adulthood, the brain didn't really create many new brain cells, right? Like you weren't developing those. But there's recent research too showing that that does actually happen, like whether it's just in the hippocampus and in memories, but our brains can actually produce new cells. It's not just new connections. So I think there's a lot of reason for optimism and exciting stuff about how we can improve our brain health Health overall physically mentally psychologically on all components of that absolutely uh, it's a wonderful almost renaissance for neuroscience right now with neurogenesis and gut health and um, you know even the psychedelics revolution right like there's a lot of uh, new science and new opportunities to help people mm -hmm. to basically live a live a better life have better well-being uh, and be more productive. So it's a, it's a great place to be in and a good place for young people to, to get involved in careers, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of well-being, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was going through different kind of stages of life and looking at what we can do to boost brain health at different ages. Because I think, you know, there's some consistent things, right? Like exercise and diet are going to affect your um, brain health throughout the lifespan. But there's stuff that you can do at different ages. So like mm -hmm. if you have kids who are, you know, very young babies, toddlers, what kind of stuff can you do at that age to improve uh, babies or toddlers brain health? Sure. Yeah. Um so I like to try to uh, divide this up between the first five years uh, and then childhood, which would be maybe five to 10, and then we could talk about youth. Um, mm -hmm. In the first five years, it's uh, remarkable that uh, the brain develops from very small when the baby's just born to 90% of the adult uh, brain size by the age of five. So it was a really zero to five is a massively rapid uh, growth phase. And um, we do recognize now that, uh, you know, just uh, playing with kids in a, in a healthy way, having what's called serve and return or like healthy interactions with kids, playing peekaboo, all this kind of uh, mm. is super helpful for brain development. Um, and so that's probably the biggest takeaway is is literally playing peekaboo with with uh, with toddlers is important for their brain wiring and their brain development and then of course giving them a, a sort of safe um, safe environment uh, safe upbringing you know good food mm -hmm. and water and stuff uh, and there's actually a wonderful TED talk uh, by a, a young Australian girl called Molly Wright called What If Peekaboo Could Save the World uh, where this young lady talks about uh, from her perspective, brain science relevant to uh, to, to the first five years of uh, uh, with brain development. Uh, I encourage people to look at that TED talk because it, it, it describes it very well. And um, hmm. also, uh, interestingly, now there are well, I think we we need to talk about screen time, of course. So in the first five yeah. years, screen time, they say recommendations now from from expert groups is that. Uh, kids between the ages zero and five shouldn't be watching any, you know, videos on smart devices, on iPads or whatever it is, but they can participate in like video talking, uh, video communications with, with family. So that like, oh, exactly so like a Zoom important. call with family. Or, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I think 
you know, that kind of, you've got to be very careful about screen time. Uh, and, and then finally, Ian, uh, interestingly, they're actually um, uh, companies that are providing neuroscience-inspired toys uh, for kids between the age of zero and five that are, that are specifically designed by neuroscientists to speed healthy brain development, um, special, okay. and you get, you get toys every X number of months that are designed for that stage of life. So you're kind of amazing what you can do. Uh, to yeah. optimize brain development for, for toddlers, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about that tech too. So not using tech as a distraction necessarily for babies or toddlers, but if you're using it as a tool to aid in social development, so you know, using screen time to connect with friends or family members in that kind of context of social development and social connection with other people, that's when it's okay, that's when it's good? Yes, exactly. That's when it's good yeah. uh, and when you're you're sort of leveraging those benefits and then not getting the mm -hmm. sedentary time of like cat's potato time, if you will. Uh, yeah, so it's mentally it's... active as well as um, using the tech. Exactly, yes. And, and, and trying to keep the kids physically active and not sort of sat too much in one spot uh, at a time being sedentary, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So from that age range of about five to 10, then what kind of things are you looking at with developmental milestones or brain health development? What can you do there? Sure. I, you know, I think um, this is obviously uh, a time that's very important for screen time uh, monitoring. I think it's, it's, the, it's the time when kids are getting really, really active physically. And so you want to try to promote that that healthy body healthy life uh, good food uh, good rest and in particular not letting them spend huge amounts of time on uh, smart devices on the computer or on iPads which is obviously very tempting uh, as a parent because they can yeah. become a handful so so I think really looking at the professional guidelines speaking to your PCP or or or, or, or such about the right kind of screen time and developing like a digital hygiene as best as you can um, to, to manage screen time is, is critical. Um, but then, you know, here's an interesting innovation. There's a, uh, an organization called My Brain Robbie, which is actually starting to look at uh, dementia prevention, would you believe? Dementia prevention, okay. dementia is something we normally think okay. about in older adults, looking at that in, in the child age range between like five and 12. Uh, and my brain, Robbie, is, a, is really a cartoon brain uh, developed by a French neuroscientist, uh, which is, uh, Robbie is basically a public health advocate for kids about how do they protect their brains. And it's all about making, you know, trying to protect your brain from brain injuries, from falling, hmm. uh, hurting your brain, which we know can, can be a you know, trigger uh, risk factor for dementia. and the importance of healthy eating, socializing, uh, exercise, things like this. So these are, you know, you could imagine almost like whatever an older adult would do for dementia prevention, that's just relevant to kids as well. Um, uh, so that's kind of just a, a very new way of thinking about the brain health of a child, which I find mm. kind of fascinating and really unexpected, right? Who would have thought that dementia yeah. prevention would start in that, that young, but, but we, we know that now that it does. Yeah, the other thing that I think is interesting at that age too, that I think sometimes gets forgotten when parents are talking about kind of intelligence and cognitive ability from the perspective of achievement in school and education is some of the social and emotional development, especially about developing empathy, because that's a really, really critical age for people, especially children, to learn about understanding other people's emotions, being able to talk about emotions, reflect those back and how to understand other people. And I know, because um, I'm a personality psychologist, it's one of the deficits we look at sometimes in personality if people don't develop empathy and don't have those kind of positive emotional connections with caregivers at that age, sometimes people struggle throughout their whole life um, to develop those kind of empathetic relationships. So that's, I think, another thing. Do you think parents forget about that sometimes and the focus on other types of cognition? Uh, a very good point, yeah. I, I, I think you're right. It, it needs to be emphasized, uh, particularly in a world where soft skills are increasingly important, yeah. as we know, for the for jobs of the future where... We, we really need to be tuned in from an emotional intelligence perspective, um, working in advanced teams, working interdisciplinary in the future. So, so empathy is critical yeah, exactly. for sure. And, and maybe it's, it's a 
a good point to say, Ian, right, that uh, mask wearing uh, has been critical during the pandemic, uh, also mm. for kids and parents, but uh, mask wearing, we know, has really kind of impaired uh, facial expression reading and sort of normal um, yeah. feedback for kids sort of seeing what, what they say, how people respond and, and getting that and, and then reacting to it. So this kind of uh, bi-directional uh, facial expression um, type dynamics is, is probably being a little bit impaired for kids. Uh, and that's obviously mm -hmm. a challenge with empathy because how can you empathize if you can't see people's facial expressions? Even us adults know that it was a little challenging uh, yeah. with wearing masks. And so not to say that that's a, a problem that can't be fixed or, or a sort of uh, uh, development that was impeded that can't be made up. I think you can make that up for sure. And so parents kind of, another thing to add to their plate is to try to foster uh, foster really healthy social uh, interactions for their kids so that they can kind of get back up to speed, if you will. Yeah, and I think it's one of those challenges, and I think a lot of parents talk about this, is how there's so many things that you should be doing or shouldn't be doing or all of these lists. So it's kind of good to understand that, you know, we have to balance necessities and, you know, different priorities at different stages in life and do our best at all of these stages and do the best for cognitive, emotional, kind of empathy development, all of that stuff. But there's no perfect answer and there's no one thing you should be doing 100% of the time. You just need to balance priorities and risks in your own life and your family and your friends, whatever those kind of necessities are. And then teaching kids about that is really useful too because, you know, no one has a perfect life trajectory where nothing goes wrong. There's always deciding on what those balances are and what to prioritize at the right time in the right environment and the right kind of group right yeah absolutely yes yes we uh we parents have a have a, have a mighty job and so we want to yeah. encourage them to, to to do their best and and kids are very resilient right and as we talked about at the start very their brains are very neuroplastic so they'll they'll do well if they're in a generally loving caring uh attentive uh home environment yeah exactly so what about teenagers when we're getting to those kind of stages of those really intense social developments, more um, kind of development of individual identity, social identity, all of that's kind of expanding, independence is coming on. What do we need to know about brain health there? You know, I think that this is in some ways the most important uh, period of life uh, relevant to brain health. Um, this is when the vast majority of uh, mental health challenges, depression and anxiety actually uh, begin, get, get catalyzed because of all of these stresses and change dynamics in life. And so uh, you know, this could be the best window for us to really think hard about brain health. Um, okay. And uh, the statistics are, are, are not good, particularly in America, um, but I'm sure it's the same for youth uh, all around the world. Uh, this group is really struggling, has, has struggled during COVID and is still struggling uh, mm -hmm. with, with, we're seeing spikes in rates of uh, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. Uh, and a lot of this is, you know, is probably driven by social media usage, uh, social mm -hmm. media usage, which, um, you know, which can be quite, quite toxic for, for kids. Uh, at, for youth in particular, as they're, you know, as you described, right, going through these body changes, these changes in their mind, independence from family, but, you know, studying pressure and uh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think, you know, we need to really be, I think there, there's individual things we can do as, 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 as parents or friends or family units, but then we also probably do need to think about societal and system changes. Uh, I think on the individual side, really being very, very careful with digital hygiene uh, and social yeah. media usage is critical. So, it, you know, encouraging people to develop a bit of a digital hygiene practice for, for their youth at home and, and keep almost like a bit of a social contract with them. Like, you know, mm -hmm. ideally no social media in the morning, none, none, you know, adhering to like the school's policies no social media usage at the at the dinner table or, or in, during family yeah. time and and just kind of really you know circumscribe social media use because as, as we know in that stage of brain development um, the ability to sort of manage the enticement uh, of 
search meter yeah. is, a, is a challenge, right? It uh, requires a, real, a lot of uh, self-control that, that at that stage of life, you're still building those parts of your brain, particularly the prefrontal cortex. So, so just having that really tight control se seems to be really critical and can actually help to abate a lot of those feelings of uh, you know, anxiety, stress, and that kind of thing. And, and then of course, you know, all of the same brain health things are relevant, you know, healthy eating, uh, coming yeah. back, just making a point about you know, like the, the, a Mediterranean type diet is uh, is really known now to be the best for the brain. Um, so how do you foster healthy healthy eating and and you know exercise and all these things are of course a challenge with kids that uh, with youth that have to study for you know study high school uh, exams to try to get into college and all this kind of stuff. Like I said, there's a lot of things going on. So so again, it's yeah. doing your best to juggle all these things. Yeah, and I think it's tough, too, when you're looking at social development, too, because all the ways we teach people to communicate or teach kids to communicate in kind of adolescence, all of a sudden they have to take those skills then when they're 20, 30 years old and use those. Like traditionally, it would have just been in person, but all of those social media skills that they've developed or not developed are stuff that's going to be useful in the career, right, for job search or connecting up with other colleagues, collaborators, people you might work with, finding information about careers in the workplace. So it's an interesting transition to figure out how to kind of help adolescents, teenagers figure that stuff out, but then also to be able to move from using it under supervised conditions to be able to use it healthily, effectively, independently, um, because then it's going to be kind of a core part of their social experience, right, in 20s and 30s. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think that speaks to the need for them to develop personal responsibility, right? Um, yeah. To develop an internal locus of control that, 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 that they need to understand the benefits and the risks of uh, digital device usage. Uh, so parents that are just very draconian and uh, taking a really heavy hand disciplinarian approach may be helpful when the youth is at home in a contained environment, mm -hmm. relatively contained environment, but as soon as they leave home, they haven't developed those sort of internal mechanisms. So really important that, that they're sitting at the table as a, as, a, as a partner in sort of learning how to deal with this stuff. And, it, and it's not easy, right? Like, yeah. Ian, we know as we've, as we've uh, grown up that, that the pace of change with digital devices and the new digital devices is, is, is just so rapidly changing. So we do our best to keep up with it. And now we have the metaverse coming on board. You know, what does this yeah. mean for generations now that are maybe eight or ten years old? What that, what's, what's the metaverse going to mean when they're youth? So you know, just a, it's a really active moving space that, that, you know, we just need to do our best to keep, keep our handle on. Yeah, definitely. So then what about in that 20 to 30 year age range? Because that's the kind of area that people's brains are still developing, right? Quite substantially, like personality doesn't crystallize until... 20s sometimes late 20s brains are still developing and then all of that independence that people were hopefully starting to learn about in adolescence all of a sudden comes on really fast in your early 20s so what kind of stuff for brain health should you be doing and mental health too because i know a lot of people who are moving from school to the workforce have really struggled with that kind of independence and the contrast between kind of moving away figuring out career stuff what in your brain kind of mentally physically can you do yeah i it's a, it's a very good question. Um, my sense is that, uh, you know, just recognizing that it is there's a, a lot of frenetic change going on, particularly getting into the workforce, because the workforce is getting really competitive right now. Um, mm -hmm. So we can't underestimate the complexities there. Uh, moving away from home, being independent, uh, and, um, you know, I think that uh, finding a sense of community is critical. Mm -hmm. I think that as you're moving away from college or undergraduate or grad school into the into the into the big wide world, making sure that you find a good you know, values-based community is critical. Uh, particularly during COVID, right? How many people do we know that have left undergrad or postgrad and and moved across the country or moved across the world? All to be in a pandemic and lonely and isolated, mm -hmm. and to to actually develop a sense of community wasn't easy. So so I think this uh, learning how to deal with this isolation challenge, uh, you know, or you know, or unwind yourself out of it, 
is, is yeah. really critical. To me, that's one of the biggest issues uh, is, this, is this isolation challenge and, and really how, how can you build up your community uh, you know, to get out there and overcome your social anxiety from being behind a Zoom screen for a couple of years uh, you know, find your community of whatever kind of hobby or whatever it may be, um, and and then of course it's about you know particularly as you're as you're independent now away from college, like getting into the right routines for uh, cooking for yourself or finding you know healthy food sources, th things like this. But it this is a really fiercely independent stage, right? Where you're you're again you're balancing all these different factors. Um, but but I would say yeah. in that my the, the, these these brain health factors like you know managing your health, managing your 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 weight as best as you can, healthy eating, exercise, they're basically consistent across the lifespan. Yeah. Um, so those should always be the staple of what we think about uh, these what called uh, you know modifiable risk factors for dementia or brain health strengthening factors are, are really key throughout all of the life uh, span. Yeah, and at that age, I think one of the things that you pointed out too is those kind of diverse but cohesive and resilient friendship networks or social groups and social support groups. And that's something that, again, once you're independent, you can really develop yourself, but it makes someone so much more resilient to have that, especially if it's not kind of all your eggs in one basket, right? So if your friends are only part of, you know, one job network and you lose that job, all of a sudden mm -hmm. you haven't just lost your job, you've lost your whole social support network. So having those kind of range of connections and people you can talk to and connect with about all sorts sorts of different stuff is something that you're building up there that's going to help the health of you and your community or your social network, your social group throughout your whole lifespan. Um, yeah. And then hopefully into that kind of older adult age. So what's the next kind of phase? What are the next challenges or the next opportunities for building brain health at kind of post 30? Uh, I think if we, if we zoom through a couple of them, I think the, the perinatal life stage uh, for women and for, for, uh, couples is, is really critical, uh, okay. you know, also very closely tied to the early childhood brain development in the first five years we talked about uh, initially. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, just, just kind of recognizing that the, the phase of, uh, you know, having a baby is, is a lot of massive change and, and you've, you've yeah. really got to look after yourself and look after people that are going through that, look after your partner, whatever it may be. I think this is a, a critical period because if you're a you know healthy, happy parenting couple, you'll have a healthy and happy kid. Um, and then I think we start to get into um, maybe a little bit of like midlife uh, when it comes to technology in particular for brain health, mm -hmm. getting used to dealing with fake news uh, in the modern uh, okay. world of uh, of, of media is critical. I think we, we know in the US in particular, right, how much fake news or myths and disinformation is, is circulating. And so yeah. from a brain health perspective, you know, what are you doing to try to make sure that you're not being misled? Uh, because mm -hmm. if, you, if you can be misled uh, over a space of a few years, we of course know what can happen. We can get things like the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol um, so, so I think mm -hmm. this, this is a little, this is, you know, this is not like conventional brain health, but this is really like almost like a brain hygiene thing, right? In, in the 21st century. Yeah. So, so do you have some, some ideas in your mind when you read a news source, for example, uh, is this real? Is this credible? Does it seem within the realms of possibility that, it, that you know, or should I just, should I regard it or disregard it? Um, I think this kind of uh, media literacy, digital media literacy is critical. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point, because now there's so many more connections between social media and traditional media, right? They're embedded in each other. You can't really separate them. And they're embedded in all of our news feeds, social feeds, whatever. It's not really a realistic expectation to say, OK, I'm going to get rid of all social media, all um, kind of digital media, and I'm just going to only pay attention to what's happening in my neighborhood. That's not really realistic for almost anyone. Um, so kind of developing those strategies for managing information in the same way you would from figuring out who among your friendship group is a really trustworthy source of information, who's a bit gossipy, a bit less trustworthy, who you might take some of their opinions with a grain of salt, but figuring out how to manage that for all those external sources of information too, right? Absolutely, yes. And um, 
there are some good resources online, little uh, acronyms or little checklists of, of assessing news sources uh, about the credibility and, and the veracity and where is the primary data coming from that I would encourage people to try to uh, use one of those types of uh, little tools to, to really get a sense of, uh, of the veracity of their, of their media diet and what they are, what they are going to invest in believing versus not. Yeah. yeah, there's a really good one. I like the acronym because it's called the CRAP test. It's C-R-A-P-P. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Google the CRAP test. So that's a really good system. I think it was invented by a librarian. It was a really good system for kind of evaluating okay. information and especially the source. So that's something. And it's um, that's really two A's, isn't it? Uh, two A's. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah you could yeah. be right. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, it'll come up. Google the CRAP test. It'll come up. Yeah. Um, so then when we're looking at later stages of life, what kind of strategies for brain health are we looking at there? Obviously, we've built this strong foundation of good diet. Mediterranean diet is really helpful. Developing, hopefully, consistent patterns of exercise. Not It doesn't have to be intense physical exercise or running marathons, but just something you enjoy, you can do regularly, you can keep up with. Um, what other stuff should we be looking at for brain health later in life? I think later in life... Um really managing medical conditions that, as we know, uh, okay. come on more in later life. So uh, managing blood sugar, managing body weight, uh, those types of things are important. So just generally going to see your PCP, your primary care doctor, or your family doctor, or your GP, whatever, in whatever country you're in, depending on what you call it, that kind of thing mm -hmm. is super helpful, right? And so if you, if yeah. you do see your blood sugars going up and you're getting into pre-diabetes or diabetes, you can really manage that straight away because that's, a, that's again, a modifiable risk factor for dementia. Um, yeah. uh, not smoking is obviously critical uh, and, yeah. and, and almost goes without saying these days. Uh, and then you know, cognitive activity. Uh, how do you stay cognitively active? Uh, I think maybe we say, like, particularly in retirement age, Right when you're, um, you know, you've got this decision when you retire of like, do you do you really really retire and take it very easy, which many people instinctually want to do because they've worked their whole lives and they're exhausted and dealing with the world is complicated, dealing with people, you know, customers at work and stuff, um, but but recognizing that retiring into into mental activity is critical too. So how do you, yeah. you know, keep reading, uh, keep socially active, uh, you know, volunteering, trying to, to, to stay uh, ideally as you can because th these types of things will keep you in a longer, what's called a health span. Not only will they improve your lifespan in years, but they'll improve your health years as well, your health span so yeah. that you're, you're, you're as healthy as possible uh, for as long as possible. Um, so uh, I think I think those are really the some of the best strategies to, to think about for sure. Okay, and what kind of stuff like, you know those brain training apps or things that say they're improving brain power, are those useful? Are they any good? Is there much evidence for those? Or is just that kind of social activity contributing to your community a better source of um, kind of brain health than those? Yeah, I think that those brain games are... Um, they're good at training you to do better at the brain game, uh, but yeah. <laughs> not really generalizable to uh, complex modern life in the real world. So, yeah. uh, you know, you should still do them, uh, but, but certainly there's not a huge amount of evidence for their value in improving your cognitive function. So I would say mm -hmm. if you do those things, Sudoku, it doesn't need to be a digital uh, cognitive game. It can be pencil and paper Sudoku or crosswords but also recognize you've got to supplement that with real world uh, co cognitive activity, right? Like volunteering, you go volunteer at a uh, shelter or something like that, like that's the best kind of cognitive activity because it's cognitive activity mixed with social. Um, uh, and physical uh, activity, and, yeah. And physical activity, yeah. 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 Interesting, there, there, yeah, there, I mean, it's there's good. There's a lot of work on the brain games to try to boost the uh, credibility of the, of the scientific basis, and there are a lot of scientists yeah. working on that, so watch this space for sure. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think it goes back to the kind of original advice, even for toddlers, is figure out what the tech is for. And is it a distraction or is it a social tool to enable something else? So like, you know, during the pandemic, having Zoom as a resource for communication when you might not have any other communication, especially if you're elderly or vulnerable or have physical health issues that you have to socially isolate, then using those tools in a way that are kind of cognitively active, interesting, engaging are much better than having just a distraction that's kind of a um, passive entertainment or brain training game that isn't really training anything. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, there are some other interesting innovations, uh, Ian, in, in older adults in particular. There's a lot of work around uh, understanding wisdom and how do you boost wisdom. Uh, there's a wonderful science, particularly from a colleague, Dilip Jesse at UCSD in San Diego, recognizing that wisdom accrues over the lifespan. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and that there are, you can actually look at the brain circuits of wisdom as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And these things, things like how do you have emotion control and have more patience and how can you sort of integrate different parts of your brain to look at issues from many different perspectives. Um, there are now therapies used, uh, talking therapies to boost wisdom uh, in, in mm -hmm. older adults. So, you know, there are a lot of things. You, I think this is also coming back to like the, your neurogenesis comment. You're, you're never too old to learn. You're never too old to yeah. boost your brain. And neurogenesis certainly happens uh, when you're an older adult. You know, you, we, they do brain scans and show that just starting to exercise in late life can, can really almost double the size of your hippocampus. The, Part of your brain from memory yeah. and learning, so it's a. We should we should recognize that that, that even uh, later life is a, is a is a wonderful time. Lots of plasticity, lots of lots of potential yeah. to uh, to improve yourself and and keep uh, keep dynamic. And that really reinforces the value of having diversity in teams, but even in the sense of age, right? Of having kind of multi-generational teams or organizations where you've got people with all different experiences, all different backgrounds, and people can be learning from each other, whatever age they are, is probably really, really valuable in organizations. And we should be encouraging that if people want to be staying in the workforce, even if it's in a part-time mentoring capacity or in a support capacity or passing on that kind of wisdom um, at different stages in life could be really useful. Yeah, I think for sure, certainly in, in, in general team sense, that's critical. And then also developing products and services for older adults, right? You've mm -hmm. got to have an older adult in the room, in the team, in the product yeah, team, definitely. whatever it is. To, and, and that's uh, something that is not often done. And I think uh, often products and services generally in the world are just uh, developed for adults. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that things are designed from a design thinking UX UI perspective that are relevant to older adults? We've got to have them in the conversation because um, we, we can't leave them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that's really interesting and it's I, very optimistic, I think. There's a lot of stuff we can do. Um, is there anything, you're a neuroscientist, is there anything in particular you do for brain training or for brain health that you think other people would benefit from? Any specific or interesting kind of unique advice? Um, I think uh, meditating. We haven't talked about that. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, just just simple meditation, um, body scanning or breath meditation for 15 minutes, half an hour a day, is a is certainly a, a secret of, of mine that I use every day, and and that's obviously it's a stress reduction strategy. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so that's that's something that you can use you can even use simple breath techniques in in the middle of a conversation or sitting at the train station or something like that so this is a this is an inbuilt uh stress reduction technique that that's free uh you know you you can you can get free apps on your phone to do it better uh, or to guide you so that's one thing that's that's really critical um mm -hmm. and then i so that i think that's my that's my tip for today Sounds good. That's a great tip. I think we'll end on that and I would recommend that to everyone. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Those insights are great. Wonderful to be here, Ian. Uh, thank you for your interest and uh, I hope this was useful to everyone that's listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.